a moment to record, to share. Because it's all about telling a story, your story. To write with intent and purpose, with precision and excellence. We document our world with a passion for authenticity, with a committed focus, and with a dedication to details, large and small. Our storytelling skills are in our DNA. It's part of what makes us human. It's what we love doing. Every hour is an investment in life. An investment in the story of who we are. Free from limitations and ready to discover new moments. Intensive, lasting, iconic, real and profoundly personal. Moments that write history in the streets and beyond, in hearts and minds across generations, with consistency, with accuracy, but always different. A moment to write your story. With a Leica M6. Hello everyone, my name is Nathan Kellum. I am the Product Communications Specialist at Leica Cam USA. Thanks for joining us for another Tech Talk, this time talking about the new Leica SL3. Before I introduce uh, my co-host, I would like to do a little bit of housekeeping. You will see that on the right-hand side of your screen, there is a chat function. We would love to hear where you're tuning in from, 
This is also a great space for you to ask questions to us. We have a team looking at the chat and we can see if we can answer as many as we can today during this session. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-host. First, John Kreidler, product specialist on the East Coast. John, good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Nathan. Great to see you. Super excited for today's program, as always, uh, taking a first look at, uh, at the SL3 with our really special guest. I'm glad that we were able to convince him to come to come on and talk to us. Hopefully, we our audience will be very kind and considerate, and not ask too difficult questions or challenges too much. But we're really looking forward to today's program. Thanks, John. Me too. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Stefan Rao, the SL product manager. Stefan, really good to see you. Thank you again so much for taking the time to see us today. I know it's late uh, where you are in Germany. Um, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me in your show. Glad to have you. So before we start talking about the SL3, I would love for you to introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, maybe speak a little bit about how you started at Leica and maybe speak about your journey from your first position at Leica to now being the product manager for the SL system. Yeah, I started uh, with Leica uh, 13 years ago and I started as a process analyst in the customer care department. And after three years of being process analyst, I became a head of industrial engineering and logistics, also in the customer care department. And now, five years ago, I joined the product management team, and I'm now responsible for the SL system, which means camera, lenses, and some equipment uh, uh, before, but uh, uh, now only uh, camera and lenses. Lots of responsibility. I mean, not only the cameras that was just launched here, but also the lenses. I'm guessing that you also talked to your team about the Almat Alliance and the accessories that come with our cameras. Lot, lots to talk about today, but we're going to focus on the SL3 camera. We'll pull up uh, our slides right here, and I wanted to show uh, our audience some of the, a little bit of context as we talk about the SL3. You know, when Leica starts to think about its next camera, there's really one phrase that comes to mind very often. And Stefan, please forgive me as I butcher this uh, the saying here, it's das Wiesenli here, which translates to the essentials. And this is really how we start when it comes to thinking about our next camera, our next lens, our, our next tool for our creatives. So as we think about das Wiesenli here, as we think about the essentials, we are looking right here at this little triangle, the three pillars that we think about specifically here for our cameras, but specifically for the SL3 system. And that is first image quality. And then we talk about the build. And then finally, we focus on the user experience. And these are really the three pillars that we focused on for the SL3 camera. So today we're gonna to start with image quality. Before we showcase any of uh, the images that uh, the team here has shot, uh, I want to show off a little bit of the specs of this camera, a little bit overview of what to expect with this new system. First off, this is a amazing camera, full frame system that has a backside illuminated sensor. And just like our other full frame offerings, we offer the triple resolution technology on the sensor as well. So 60, 36, or 18 megapixels, your choice. You can choose between having those resolutions in RAW or in JPEG, uh, or both for that matter. Um, we also have a new processor inside the camera and a new autofocus uh, setting, which is a hybrid autofocus system, which combines phase detection, contrast-based autofocus and object detection. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And we have also upgraded the ISO performance now to a maximum of 100,000 ISO, and that is a stop more than on the SL2. Now, when we talk about image quality, we at Leica think about this in really three different things. So we have our optics, our lenses, of course, that bring in that light onto the sensor. We have the new sensor that we're gonna talk about. 
But something else that we don't talk about too often is the processor, the element that brings all that information together and creates this wonderful output, both in photo and in video. And this new processor is absolutely incredible. We've doubled the buffer on this camera thanks to this new processor from four gigabytes on the SL2 to eight gigabytes on the SL3. And that's going to support both still photographers, but also videographers who decide to shoot in the newest resolution here on the SL system of 8K. It also allows us to have access to the new CF Express memory card slot that will make it very easy to transfer lots of data very, very quickly. And speaking about 8K video and video, I want to share some information on that as well. Here is a quick overview of what to expect from the SL3. This camera does shoot 8K, um, everything from full HD to 8K. And one of the special things about this camera is that uh, unlike the SL2 and SL2S, to get the best quality, you no longer have to have an output via the HDMI. All of the frame rates and resolutions and quality settings can be recorded now internally thanks to the new processor and the upgraded buffer, as well as the new CF Express card slot. Additionally, this camera does not have a limitation regarding the length of video that you can record. Uh, the limitation is really going to be bound by the power that you have, either having the battery or the hand grip or some of the new accessories that we'll talk about today with the DC coupler, or the uh, amount of memory card space that you will need. But if those two elements are taken care of, you can shoot for a very, very, very long time. All right, let's dig into some images here. Here is a first shot here with the 90 APO SL, one of my personal favorite lenses. And I, one of the things I love about the SL3 is that we can now have finally access to more visibility on how good these Leica lenses are, especially the APO lenses. I've been having discussions with our team in the optics division, and they have shared with me that wide open, these APO lenses are designed to perform at a higher resolution than 100 megapixels. So it's not a problem for this new 60 megapixel sensor. It's a joy to use even wide open. And here's an example of this. And another thing that I'll, I'll share with you as well, and this is something that we broached with John uh, in the APO lens segment, is that control of contrast that we have with these beautiful APO lenses. As we zoom in to see the details of this particular image, you can see that the subject matter, the butterfly in this case, is incredibly sharp. 100% of that contrast that's available in the lens is hitting on that point of focus. But then the contrast value drops very dramatically after the point of focus and before the point of focus. And you can see this very nicely, the fact that this butterfly is on this leaf. It's a very small area that we're looking at right here. And yet the leaf is already out of focus. You can start to see that bokeh on the leaf. So really incredible performance on our optics that can be fully realized with this new beautiful sensor. John, the next image right here is your shot. Um, you know, one of the things that I love the most about the SL system as a whole is how versatile the system is. You can adapt tons of lenses to the SL system, including M lenses. And here's a great example of this with the 75 Nautilux. Would you mind sharing your thoughts on First of all, the camera, but also utilizing it with these M lenses. Yeah. So uh, it's it's interesting when uh, we were together in uh, Portugal that we uh, had a chance to shoot uh, to shoot the camera, and I found myself while I had an APO uh, Summicron uh, M50, I just enjoyed shooting M lenses. I had uh, steel rim, and I also had, of course my trusty Noctilux M75, uh, one of my, obviously my favorite lens of all time. Uh, and to me, I, and I should have been surprised at the sharpness and detail of um, that this lens still captures uh, at 60 megapixel, uh, particularly when we zoom in and see uh, kind of this, whatever that machine is. <laughs> I just found fascinating just the way it was lit on uh, somebody's bookshelf uh, in a wine cellar. Um, 
to me, the, the lens is magical and the camera captures that, allows you to create uh, or capture that information, the focus going to uh, focus plane, not only that, but that transition to and from the focus plane, very three-dimensional, very dramatic, and um, just, again, magical, for lack uh, of a better word. I just find it, again, the M lenses, uh, to me, work very well. Even the, uh, I don't think I have any examples uh, in the deck, but the even the steel rim uh, that's uh, a vintage re-release, uh, but still renders very true on the 60, 60 megapixel. And the camera is smaller and also lighter. And I think that also fits an M lens where the SL, while it's not as small and compact as an M camera, it's we're we're approaching that that territory. So it's it's exciting uh, to see that we're able to through the advancement of the technology to to do that. Um, I don't know how how do you feel about M lenses, Nathan? I, did you shoot your one thirty five at all on this camera? I, I did not yet, <laughs> although I'm very excited to do so. And I think one yeah. of the benefits of having this opportunity to adapt the M lenses and other lenses to the SL system is that you have access to things like image stabilization. You have mm. access to things like a, a different button layout with more customization as well. You have this incredible viewfinder that you can utilize with this M lenses and punch in and look at the details as you work on your focus. Um, you know, one of the, the greatest things I think about the versatility of the SL system is that all the lenses that are available on the SL system, whether it be M lenses or SL lenses or R lenses or cinema lenses, for example, is that they all have their own rendering. And so if you're trying to look for a specific type of emotional quality to your work, there is a selection of lenses that you can choose from. You're not really limited um, by that. And to even further that point, we're talking about Leica lenses. The SL system is part of the Almat Alliance. And so we have even more options from other collaborators within this space. So there's a lot of great things can, that can happen with the SL system. For me, it's really an argument of future-proofing the system. You don't, you maybe won't know what your next project will be, but uh, once you do, we can find the lens that will be the most appropriate for that project. And speaking about adapting other lenses to the SL system, I have a couple examples here using an APS-C lens on the SL system. Uh, now with 60 megapixels, we have access to 26 megapixels uh, using an APS-C lens. Stefan, I know that you have shot with APS-C lenses on the SL3. Would you, I would love to hear your thoughts and maybe some stories behind that experience using our APS-C lenses with the SL3. Yeah, thank you. Um, to be honest, I'm I'm sometimes a lazy guy, and uh, I had to test a lot of uh, firmware versions over the last months. And uh, testing only firmware, I'm too lazy to to uh, use a big lens to use the SL lenses, and therefore I used this small pancake uh, TL lens, the 18 millimeter lens, a lot of times. And uh, and then it, it came to me that not only for firmware testing, but also for taking some pictures. And uh, I used uh, this lens uh, for the first time then, and I saw 26 megapixels is a really good resolution for it and uh, enough. And uh, it brings all the benefits from, from the SL to, to these uh, uh, older but really good lenses and really small lenses. And uh, that's maybe is a story behind it, a private story. Uh, my wife used to use uh, the CL with uh, the APS lenses. And as a product manager of the SL, I wanted to convince her to use the SL2 because although the SL2 is the better camera than the CL, in my point of view, and uh, there are also benefits that the CL uh, cannot cannot deliver. And uh, I gave it to her and said, uh, try it out, but uh, I could not convince her. She said it's too bulky, too heavy, and uh, she won't use it. And uh, one day I came home uh, with the new, with a prototype of the new SL3, and I gave it to her and said, try this one out. And to make the long story short now, when we go out now to take some pictures, 
I have to use the SL2 because she's using the SL3 with her APS lens. <laughs> and the APS lens works perfectly with this with this camera. Nice. Yeah, the combination of a smaller body, a thinner body, and the APS-C lenses really does make a difference. It really invites the attendees here uh, to, or guests to, to try that out in the in the newest or nearest Leica store. Um, I was shooting the image that's on display here with the 60 millimeter macro, one of my personal favorite lenses. And as we zoom into that shot right here, I mean, 26 megapixels, just like you say, Stefan, that's more than the M10. I mean, there is a lot of resolution to work around and a lot of detail. You can see that the lens is so precise that we're focusing on the rose petals of this little uh, necklace here. And the rest of the necklace is starting to go out of focus with this very shallow depth of field that we have control over. So lots of fun to have a smaller walk around kit, but also a great way to have access to uh, some of our most uh, really, again, like you said, great lenses like the 60 millimeter macro that is also APO. Moving along to this idea of 60 megapixels, um, you know, having the ability to have so much resolution allows us the possibility to then crop in and choose our compositions a little more carefully. This image that you see in front of you is shot with the 35 APO lens, and this is also a crop of this shot right here. So lots of room to play around. If you, uh, as you're shooting uh, your image, this is a, a little long exposure of about one second. Um, there might be scenes in the frame that you wanna focus on, that you want to draw attention to. Very easy to then crop in with all the resolution that we have with this new sensor. And, the benefit of a backside illuminated sensor. We see this already with the M11, with the Q3, and of course with the SL2S, which was the introduction of this backside illuminated technology with Leica. And I love the output of the SL3 uh, when it comes to low light. Um, Stefan, for context, would you be able to share with us what your thoughts are regarding the low light performance of the SL3, maybe comparing it to previous models, maybe comparing it to the SL2 and the SL2S as reference points? Yeah, when when I first shot with the SL2, I was I was amazed. It was amazing for me to see the the ISO, the high ISO performance with the SL2. Uh, then the SL2S came out, and I thought, yeah, SL2 was good, but SL2S is even better. And SL2 is a really SL2S is a really high standard now. And the SL3, in my opinion, is something between SL2 and SL2S, and close to SL2S. But you have to think about that we talk about 60 megapixel and not 24 with the SL2S. So 60 megapixel sensor close to a 24 megapixel sensor in regards of high ISO, that's really good. It's amazing, absolutely. Um, I think that we'll talk about this in just a little bit, but not only the high ISO performance, but the file malleability, the fact that you can really control the output of that file in post-production. Uh, you know, with technology that we have these days with apps and things like that, uh, you know, denoising something has become really easy, but what we've tried to focus on is to give you as much quality in the file to begin with. And then if you want to use other technologies to make it even better, uh, that would be done at your discretion, of course. But uh, it's this idea of really providing the best file output to begin with that I feel like with the SL3 is, again, on another level, considering that it is, like you said, 60 megapixels. So we're talking a little bit about ISO and low light performance. Um, I also want to talk about autofocus. Uh, this camera has a new hybrid autofocus system with phase detection, with contrast detection, and object-based detection as well. Stefan, this is your image right here. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit about the behind the scenes, the behind the story behind this shot right here? Yeah, this image uh, was one of the first testing sessions I made with the camera. It was in uh, early summer last year. And uh, it was with an alpha firmware of the camera, and we went out to to have yeah to test it and to have some pictures. And uh, this cat came, this cat uh, cat came around, and uh, I was able to to use the tilt screen to get on eye level with the cat, which was easy and not so easy with the SL2. 
And also the new autofocus mode, the um, animal detection was very useful here. So I only have to use the animal detection and do not put much effort. And uh, the image and the output was pretty good. Also, the image quality at the end was pretty good for alpha firmware. And everything worked really, really good for such an early stage of the camera. Yeah, this shows off also just how good these lenses are. I mean, the whiskers and all the little hairs are perfectly in focus. Um, here's another example of the animal detection. Here's shots in Arizona with the 90 APO. You know, these little small birds are flying between the cacti very, very quickly. Turn on the animal detection, the camera locks on to this very small creature, not a problem whatsoever. And as you zoom into the image, you can see just how much detail is available to us. Thanks to, of course, the optical engineering that's happening with Leica, but also the ability to very easily lock on to these small and fast subjects. And this shot right here is really the image that blew my mind when it comes to how good the autofocus is. This was shot also in Arizona with my wife. And uh, I wanted to test out the uh, eye body face detection on this camera and see how good it is. Um, and so I decided to point my camera directly into the sun, which is something that I don't really recommend people to do, but it's a good way to test out the autofocus. <laughs> and not a problem. The camera was, you know, very easily was able to connect to, to the eyes, the face, the body, depending on my positioning. And despite shooting directly into the sun, not a problem whatsoever for this system. And this really, again, was proof that like, okay, we are now on a different level when it comes to autofocus and it works really, really well. This is also a great example of how good the lenses are. I mean, you can see dust particles in the air next to the subject's face and shooting right into the sun allows us to have this beautiful flare uh, that these lenses have. Despite the lenses not flying too much or designed not to flare, when you point the camera directly into the sun, you have this beautiful rainbow flare coming out of it, which is a property of the aprochromatic design of this 90 millimeter lens. And people have been asking me since the release of the camera, how good is the detection in low light? It's very good. It's very, very good. We had uh, the opportunity to go into this uh, wine cellar, and uh, this is uh, a teammate. His name is Rio on the left-hand side, checking out the, the wine barrels and I just asked him to uh, you know, point his head up a little bit and took a portrait of him. The image, uh, the body detection worked flawlessly in the situation. And this is a shot that I took while walking with you, Stefan, in Porto at night. I wanted to try this out on subjects in the streets with uh, lighting from a nearby restaurant. Again, not a problem for the camera to detect these subjects, even in low light. So. Stefan, congratulations to you and your team. This works amazing. This is going to be very, very helpful for a lot of customers moving forward. Thanks a lot. Now that we talked a little bit about autofocus and low light, let's talk about dynamic range. This image right here was shot by Stefan. Stefan, would you mind sharing a little bit about the context of this particular shot? Yeah, I was with a colleague. I was in, in Italy to test and benchmark the camera. And uh, one day we were in Tuscany in Siena, and this is uh, the tower, I don't know its, it's a name, it's a tower in Siena, and uh, you can go on the inside of this. And uh, yeah, this beautiful view was uh, really easy to catch with uh, the, the tilt screen, and I used the, the 14 to 24 millimeter lens, it was uh, new also there. and. Um, yeah, it was a little bit underexposed, uh, the picture itself, and then uh, uh, some some different, uh, some slight uh, um, uh, corrections in, in Lightroom brought this brilliant and really good uh, picture out. And you can see the dynamic range of the camera and of the sensor is really, really good. Absolutely. Capturing those highlights in the sky with the tower, but also the shadow detail down below. I'm also noticing how good the distortion correction of that lens is and how perfectly straight that rectangle is when you look up to the sky. A nice little feature there. John, the next image right here was taken by you and similar situation, right? Where we're underexposing to retain our highlights. Can you show us a little bit more about this particular situation? Sure, sure. So this was uh, in a academy workshop uh, in Brooklyn with one of my favorite photographers to work with, Toots in his uh, studio space. And it was a natural 
light workshop. So other than a few reflectors are pretty much using the light that was that was coming in and um, it was very challenging uh, for me shooting some BTS and just about everything was uh, backlit like we were here. But the camera uh, or the I should say the file from the SL3 is there's a lot of bottom end to it, a lot of detail that's there that through processing you can really bring out so and it's as well as being able to control the highlights very well so you can see uh the the first image on the left is really how gray it was outside but then being able to open it up and still retain uh, a lot of detail and show more detail in the shadow area uh, by utilizing lightroom um, again just speaks to how malleable this these files are and you can't you know don't be afraid to to push them and really test it you know that's that's one thing i know when i get a new camera i really want to essentially strangle it uh to get everything out of it and really understand how it works so this was kind of one of those situations absolutely i know the feeling john because i did the exact same thing with this shot right here where I purposely underexposed the image by three stops to really see how good it could be. And this was at twilight in Arizona. So very little light to work with. What I was most impressed with with these files is, of course, the dynamic range allows you to do, you know, take out the shadows, bring down the highlights, all these kinds of things. But what it really impressed me was the sensitivity of the sensor to color. The fact that with, in particular, with the APO lenses and how precise those lenses are, the sensor is able to extract all of that color information very, very nicely. And you can see that on the left-hand side is my raw file, on the right-hand side is the edited file. And some of the colors that you're not seeing in the raw file are there in the raw file. You just have to get them out via Lightroom or Capture One. And you have this beautiful result of the mountain ranges and the gradation in the mountain range, uh, the blue sky that was actually what the color really was when I was shooting this, and of course the cacti in front of it. So just like John says, please go ahead, push the camera. The, the camera is able to, to take it. Um, and uh, it's really fun to see how much detail and how much information is being captured. And as you dive into the files and zoom in with the 60 megapixel sensor, uh, there's just a lot to look at, which is really, really great. All right, folks, we're going to uh, switch gears and now talk about the build of this camera. Uh, this is for me one of the biggest features of the camera because this camera has done something that I thought was not possible. And I was telling Stefan this a couple of days ago. I thought that the camera would either have a tilt screen or either have IP54 and not both. But the engineers have figured it out and uh, we're able to implement both of those features into the same camera. This is really a testament to the detail-oriented nature that our team in Germany has, and I'm very thankful for that. This camera can also resist a lot of very intense situations, including very low temperatures and very high temperatures. Um, it can go down to minus 10 Celsius, all the way to plus 40 Celsius, but Stefan, would you like to share with the team what degrees you actually test the camera at? Yeah, we, we tested not only for minus 10 to plus 40. Uh, our quality department is testing from minus 40 to plus 70. And after this test, the camera still performs very well. No problem after all. And that's uh, incredible. That's all, uh, we had with the SL2. Uh, we had an expedition, we, we uh, gave an expedition, uh, the camera systems SL2 and SL2S, they were in the, in the Antarctic and uh, took some pictures there and um, they used the camera at minus 50 degrees and it was no problem for them. The biggest problem was, uh, the, the guy, guy told me that uh, all, all 30 minutes he had to, to remove the battery and use a new, new battery. So that was his biggest problem by, at minus 50 degrees. So if that's the biggest problem, then I would say we have no problem. <laughs> and uh, for those here in the US, minus 40 degrees Celsius is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a good way to, to remember it. 
uh, and uh, plus 70 degrees, the, the, the high end of the testing is about 153 degrees Fahrenheit. So this also speaks to, again, that heat management uh, whenever you're shooting video as well. Um, and this is really a camera that is extremely durable. Uh, this is a camera that you take to the Arctic, to the desert, and everything in between. And in combination, again, with the ceiling that we have with our lenses, this is a full system that is designed to go into these harsh temperatures. The camera, of course, is handmade in Germany, just like our other full frame systems. I want to share some more information about the build. We have a couple new dials. One is on the top left of the camera if you're looking at the viewfinder. Uh, we also have a time code sync and a new power button. Stefan, would you mind sharing a little bit about the decision making process of choosing to go with a button with an LED marking around it rather than the switch, which was on the SL2 system? Yeah, we, we know and we knew that the switch uh, was very well perceived by our customers and uh, it was not easy to remove it. But at the end, uh, it was a logical decision. And uh, we have the Leica Photos app. And I would say it's the best app in the, in the photo market. And with the Leica Photos app, you can uh, remote wake up your camera. And that was possible with the SL2 as well. But with the SL2, you then had the situation that the camera, that the lever was standing at off but the camera was on because you turned it on with your smartphone, with the Photos app. And that was, was a logical mistake. And we wanted to get rid of that logical mistake. And that was the idea when the power button came in. And at the end, uh, we did the power button with the LED ring around it. And with the LED ring around, we have now several possibilities uh, to show several states of the camera right now it's showing um, the camera is on with the light with a, with a white light and the camera is charging with a green pulsing light but for the future we have uh, possibilities to show different states there so after all it's a really nice feature and also if you turn the camera to sleep mode with this button, just a, a, a short, short press on it, it's in sleep mode. You can use the camera with only one hand because you can wake it up with the shutter release button. So then the camera is totally usable with only one hand. And that was something a customer were complaining about the SL2. Now the buttons move to the right, right hand side and um, the power button is sometimes not needed if you, it's, uh, if you set the camera to sleep mode. So we can fully use it with only one hand. I I love this new button, Stefan. I think that it's you know really nice. I, I just, for example, was charging the camera via USB C just yesterday, and you know when the camera is charging, you have this very beautiful glow of the green light. But when the camera is charged, it's a solid green light. And so from across the room, I can see what's going on with the camera. I can see oh. Looks like my camera's charged, I can go out and shoot. Um, you know, you mentioned the sleep mode. This is also something that I really love to use because the wake up time of the sleep mode is less than a second. And so if I'm walking down the street, maybe I'm not shooting right this moment, but something may come up. So I put it in sleep mode, I walk around, something does happen. And then with just the shutter, like you said, turning it on and it's crazy, crazy fast. So this for me is a great improvement in the overall design of the camera, just not only uh, an idea of speed, but also an idea of providing more information for the user for the things that they do all the time, including charging the camera. Having just that visual indicator for me is a big quality of life improvement. John, what are your thoughts on this, this new design? You are a devoted SL2 shooter with, with the, uh, the, the, the dial on the power button. This must have been a big change for someone like you. Yeah, well, it, when I took it out of the box, uh, I didn't see the switch. I was like, okay, this is interesting. Uh, but like you say, the the on time, uh, both from sleep and from totally off, is it feels much faster than, uh, than the SL2 or the SL2S. So uh, for me, I, I welcome it. And like you say, when, when I'm out shooting, it's very quick to put it in. Um, you know, sleep mode, where before I would wait for the camera to put itself to sleep. Uh, so it's it's great. The, the other thing I've noticed is if there's not a memory card in the camera, it uh, it glows red. Like if you hit the 
the shutter release button, you get a warning that there's no memory card, but that also glows. Um, and also when you shoot, if you hold the camera up to your eye, the white on light turns off. So it's not distracting yeah. you while you're shooting. So um, a lot of interesting things, same with the, uh, the tilt screen, um, to me, I enjoy it so much with the Q3, but this has such a solid, solid feel to it uh, that's a little different than uh, than the Q3. And it's it's also centered on the EVF, which is really nice. And if you're a person that likes to, to have the camera switch automatically from EVF to LCD, when that screen is out, the camera basically turns off or disables the EVF. So, you know, if you're looking down, um, like I do, almost using the screen as a waist level finder to become essentially invisible, uh, that could be my special power uh, <laughs> with the SL3 and Q3. When you when you bend over and you're, you 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 bend your head over and you're looking into the the screen, you instantly become invisible to your uh, to your subject. Uh, it's, it's, um, just a great way to shoot. You get a, a much nicer perspective as we saw with, uh, Stefan's, uh, cat shot, you, you know, it's, it really elevates your photography. Uh, and I think that's, that's, what's great about this camera is I, I feel the, all the improvements, uh, that we've made, uh, really allow me not just to rediscover or refine a visual signature through a choice of lenses, but actually begin to think of different ways of um, capturing things from a perspective standpoint. So it's um, it really allows me to be even more creative. So how, how has your experience been with with the new camera? This it's the exact same thing. I mean, having the the tilt screen for me is a, a big positive change on the SL3. I was just doing some event photography and testing the camera out in those environments, and now I can precisely do an overhead shot of a full mm -hmm. group, for example. That's something I I really couldn't do with the SL2 unless I was using the app. Um, having the ability to very quickly go down to you know, there's here in Seattle, we have an explosion of flowers. The spring is starting to, to, to come here. And uh, it's great to photograph things that are very, very small and download at your feet with the tilt screen very, very easily. Um, having more resolution on that tilt screen is also very nice. And so it's these little improvements that, uh, you know, once, once you have them, it's hard to go back to a situation right. where you don't have the tilt screen anymore. So when that happens, that's always a positive note. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing, we, we talked a little bit about the app. Uh, you know, my experience, like downloading a DNG file, a DMEG file in like three seconds, uh, it's like blazing. Uh, we yeah. had tested, um, I think it was 100 uh, JPEGs, high risk, so about 20, 25 megs each, took about three minutes uh, mm. to download. And then the phone was full, so... Uh, no space left. But it, uh, it's, to me, it's it, it's incredible that we've been able to kind of figure out how to do that. Uh, and that's what makes, I think, this definitely the best uh, photographic app from a camera manufacturer currently. So it's uh, it's exciting to to see. And it's it's been exciting to see Nico and the team constantly pushing, you know, the envelope. Uh, for it. and it works with every camera too. So it's 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 a great tool to download and share images with. I totally agree. And that actually is a good segue to our next slide, which is the interfaces, you know, the access to the USB C port to the new CF Express card slots. Uh, you know, now you can make transfers to the Leica Photos app uh, with even faster speeds than before using the USB C port there. Uh, we're clocking around 100 megabytes per second using the cable. That means that you're doing, it's less than a second for an average raw file at 60 megapixels. And so this is, for people that do mobile workflows, this is going to be amazing to have that very quick transfer speed directly to 
an environment in which you feel very comfortable, whether it be your iPad or your phone. So really happy to see that. Um, and we spoke a little bit about the hardware changes regarding the Wi-Fi. So there is some new Wi-Fi hardware that allows us to have access to those faster speeds uh, for the Leica Photos app. And uh, you know we mentioned the USB-C also great for, for charging the camera. The camera is rated up to 27 watts, which means that you can use basically uh, you know, your laptop charger, for example, for best performance. Uh, but the camera will charge when it's off uh, down to 2.5 watts. So basically any USB-C brick will work to charge the camera. If you want to have a faster charging experience, uh, a higher wattage brick will be beneficial to you. And this brings me to this picture right here, which is just a kind of an overview of the design. And Stefan, I want to ask you a little bit about the behind the scenes, the process behind making a camera like this. Could you share with us a little bit about how long it takes from the first day until the finalized decision that this is going to be how the camera is going to look, what the hardware is going to be? I'm sure there's a lot of conversations with your team for long periods of time before you lock in that particular decision. Yeah, it is a long time. Uh, we started the project, <laughs> uh, I would say, three and a half years ago, and uh, it took us over two years to finalize uh, the design. So this is design phase starts with, uh, normally designers started with some sketching, then a uh, uh, CAD program, they use uh, 2D data and uh, discuss internally what is the best solution. And there are several rounds that they use internally after they come up with a solution to present it to product management. And then again, they go back and uh, improve and improve and improve. And uh, at the end, uh, we have some 3D printing, some 3D mockups that we can hold in hand and uh, charge it. And at the end, it's still not finished and they have to do another round. So it's countless iterations at the end they do. And uh, yeah, after two and a half years or over two years, we had the final decision how the camera body should look like. And then it was the decision what you see now. So two years, that's that's quite some time. And I'm guessing that during that process, you are doing prototypes and touching and uh, testing the feeling of the camera as well. Not only, you know, the functionality of it, but where the, the buttons are placed and how they interact with the rest of the system. I'm sure there's a lot of back and forth specifically on what it feels like. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. So our design team, they are located in Munich and uh, we, the headquarter is located in Wetzlar. And uh, there's a lot of exchange. Uh, we have a lot of traveling from Wetzlar to Munich and from Munich to Wetzlar to, to exchange. Uh, some things can be done via Teams or Zoom, but not everything. So we have a lot of travel time uh, to, to get the best solution for our cameras and our products. That's amazing. I think that's a, a good segue to our third pillar of this camera, which is the user experience. Um, this is for me a, another big part of the camera. And you know, we were talking internally, Stefan, about this new menu and this new UI design. And I thought that the design of the camera was very good. The, the design of the menu on the SL2, SL2S is, is very good. But yet we made the decision to completely redesign the menu with new icons and also a new font. Uh, and a new design language of how the camera operates. Could you share a little bit about how this decision of really focusing on the UI became a big part of the SL3? We started also a long time ago with this uh, decision or this process, uh, and we knew that the, the menu structure and the menu itself was very well perceived by our customers and also not by the Leica customers. Also, we did some uh, user reviews and user surveys with uh, other brands, from, from customers from other brands, and also they told us that the Leica UI is one of the best, if not the best in the market, and uh, that's a pretty hard start to, to start from a very high level then uh, to improve something. Uh, but we knew that there also were some minor mistakes, some minor logical mistakes. And uh, that was uh, the, the idea to, to renew not only the main the, the menu structure, also the, the fonts, also the icons and to do uh, everything around it. 
and uh, to have a complete new feeling then and uh, all icons and everything you see now is much more contemporary than it was before and uh, we talked about the, the the body the build quality before uh, you cannot upgrade hardware but you can upgrade software so one promise that leica gives uh, with the customer is that when a customer buys a leica camera and leica lens he gets the best hardware and uh, we showed with the sl2 that there are constantly firmware updates available with the SL2. We are now at firmware version 6.1. And we started with a very solid body and with a very good hardware and upgraded the software from time to time and uh, made it even every time a better camera. And uh, that was the, the plan and the idea for the SL3 as well to start with a very good body and with very good hardware. And also start here with some new idea and some new user interface. And also here, we are still not finished. It was a really big step, but also not finished. There will be uh, firmware upgrades to, to slightly adjust some things. And uh, also there, there are coming some updates. Yes, this is one of the things that I really noticed when we were talking with uh, the internal teams in the UI. They seem to be very hungry for feedback. They want to hear what our customers have to say about this new UI. There seems to be very positive feedback about the UIs to, to begin with, but always room for improvement, especially in the software side, side of things that, like you said, is easier to change. Um, you know, you can have an example right here on the slide of a comparison between the old icons and the new icons. And for me, this idea of accessibility, of clarity, of being more touch friendly as well, but also providing users with more information. I think that a prime example of that is the battery icon that now has these bars that clearly indicate where you're at with your battery, um, but also just more visibility, uh, such as the last icon, the uh, IDR standard icon, which is a lot clearer to see now on uh, this with this new UI. But that's not all. Not only did uh, Leica decide to redo all of the icons from scratch and have a new font, we've also made a separation between the photo menu and the video menu. And I think that this is a, a welcome change as well because a lot of the settings in these cameras overlap between photo and video. And so clearly we needed something a little bit different. Uh, and so now when you're in your menu, when you have a red highlight, uh, it is a very easy to see that you're in the photo menu. And if you have a yellow highlight, that's in the cine or video uh, menu. Now, for those in the chat here, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Uh, the decision to use red was due to, of course, like a camera, like uh, uh, Leica, red, our logo. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but we also decided to go with yellow for video. Would anybody in the chat would like to guess why Leica decided to go with yellow for video? And I'll leave a couple, about 30 seconds here for you to write in your comments. So why did we decide to go from, uh, go to yellow for video? And I'll give the people in the chat a hint. It has to do with a connection that Leica has with a particular product that is associated with Leica. All right, I'll give it uh, five more seconds here. Stefan, would you like to provide the answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, I may, maybe everyone knows, uh, or not everyone knows, but there is a, a company called uh, Light Cine. They are also located in Wetzlar and Light Cine. They are doing the famous uh, Cine lenses and uh, the engravings. A lot of engravings on these lenses are in yellow, and that's the the color we use for our menu and the video menu. I love that. I love the connection to other parts of the company coming into the software side of things. Uh, here in this new UI. I think that's really beautiful. So here's a quick overview of some of the changes, some of the bigger changes, not only the control center, but also the live view menu and the actual menu structure and the, ch the differences between the older version and the newer version. Again, a lot more streamlined, a lot more touch friendly, uh, and a lot more accessible to see exactly what's going on with uh, this new design. And we're going to dive a little bit more into this particular subject here, 
with this slide showing even more details regarding the new UI change. Um, you know, some of the things that I really appreciate, Stefan, when it comes to the UI is the ability to make decisions on the visibility of the icons on LiveView. Uh, in particular, on the top left example, where you can choose to have a translucent black background behind the icons for maximum visibility, or if you prefer to see the live view pixels behind those icons, that's also something that you can choose from. You can also choose to now for the first time have more icons, more information on the right-hand side of the live view screen uh, should you choose so. The ability to uh, do customization in the control center. You have all these different tiles beneath the exposure information and you can do a long press to make an adjustment to what that tile is indicating. Very easy to swipe between images and favorite them. This is a great workflow for a lot of people. The ability to tap onto a uh, icon in Live View to quick at, quickly access that particular setting. And something that I discovered uh, recently that I absolutely adore is the ability to swipe up and down in Live View to access the menu, to access the photo and video modes very, very quickly just by doing a couple swipes. No longer have the need to go and push a physical button. And finally, this, this idea of having um, the ability to go into landscape or portrait mode and have the icons change uh, depending on your orientation. These are lots of different changes that I think are very welcome to that or really make the system a lot easier to use uh, and a lot faster to use, especially that feature where you tap on the icons in Live View to have quick access to that setting. Stefan, do you have a favorite new UI component that has been introduced with the SL3 uh, within maybe some of the examples that we're sharing right here in the slides, or maybe something else that we haven't shared quite yet? It's it's not a component. It's it's more of a function or how I use it. Uh, I like it very much that uh, everything is now customizable. We have three dials. We have six FN buttons. We have these eight tiles in the control center. Everything is customizable. And if it's not enough, then we have uh, for for photo mode six user profiles. For video mode six user profiles. So my goal was to to set the camera for my workflow that I never need to go back to the main menu, even though the main menu now is much more easier as it was before and very a pleasure to use. But it, you can you can totally uh, get rid of the main menu if you set your camera with tiles in the control center, with FN buttons, with tiles, with uh, user profiles, you will never need to go back. And that's the biggest improvement for me. And that's the biggest thing I like with this new camera, with the UI. John, what are your thoughts on the new UI? Well, uh, for me, I, I, I think it's awesome. I, I like all these these changes. Uh, you know, the the SL two I thought was really was really great. But you know, talking to people, um, you know, many uh, and again, the feedback from our customers is what drives us to improve and further refine these cameras. Um, for me, I like to be able to not have uh, the black background on the information uh, of those icons. So, and now that I can utilize and customize the tiles, again, another thing that I find extremely useful, there's, in the SL2, there are tiles that I would never, never use or never, never want. Um, and, you know, it's funny when when I started to do training. One of, one of the first questions I got was, "Can uh, can I set all the tiles to the same function, like to format the memory card?" So I would have, and no, that's simply not the case because that would not make sense. So once you basically set a tile, that choice is removed from the choices for the other remaining tiles if you want to change it. So. Um, that, and also I would say, uh, when shooting vertical to have the information then be easy, easily readable. So I don't have to, you know, turn my head <laughs> and try to read, yeah. uh, read what's going on. So, uh, 
You know, and and to the the spacing on the main menu when you utilize it now that it's all touch, which to me I think is um, is a great improvement over the SL2, is that sure you can still use the joystick and you can use the thumb wheel to navigate through um, the menu, but if I find touch sometimes to be just much faster to go through and select, it's now easier to do that. And in fact, you can go all the way through and use touch in the main menu. So again, another mm -hmm. great, great improvement. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. So as we wrap up our session today, I uh, wanted to provide uh, an overview of everything that's happening with this new camera launch. Lots of really important hardware changes, but also software changes. And of course, as Stefan said, we are continuously open to feedback and looking forward to updating the camera with new ideas and concepts from the experience of our customers in the field. So please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I want to say thank you to our attendees that were here for us today. I wanted to share a couple more, a little more information regarding our academy classes before we wrap up this session here. We have a number of product-oriented academy workshops uh, that are available not only in person, but also virtually. So if you're near a Leica store, you can go to that Leica store and uh, learn more about the uh, particular camera that you have. But you can also log on remotely if you are not near any of the Leica stores. We have workshops happening on both East Coast and West Coast, featuring here a workshop uh, from Stefan Venasco, an aerial photography, a great a way to utilize your SL3 with the tilt screen, and a workshop with Todd Heido in Boston. Todd Heido is doing a tour around Leica stores around the nation, and this is a great opportunity for you to meet with this masterful artist and to hear his thoughts on photography. As we end the slide, I wanted to share uh, some contact information if you want to reach out to us. Um, there's both the uh, Instagram handles for both Leica Camera USA and Leica Academy. I also added John and my handles. We would love to speak with you. Um, Stefan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for all the information. Thank you for staying up. <laughs> I know it's a little bit late for you in, in Germany. And uh, John, thank you as always for being here with me talking about this amazing new camera. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's it's great. Uh, you know, this being the first look, I, I think we're going to have more programs as we uh, gain more and more experience with them, have more images uh, to share. I just one quick thing I think about uh, customer feedback and that we want to hear, you know, uh, future feature requests and that kind of thing. That can be done very easily right through the Photos app. So if you really want to get straight to the source, I mean, of course, you could always email Nathan or myself. Uh, but if you want to get straight to the source, just use your Photos app and any thought, any wish. And your wishes may come true if we get enough of them. Right, Stefan? <laughs> All right. We have to have right. more than one or two wishes yeah. Uh, yeah. to change things. But again, it's it's a simple thing. Uh, and, and we really want earnestly really want that feedback. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you both for being here and we'll see you on the next one. All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody.